So yes, a field guide to, the, to a happy life is my attempt to update Stoicism to the 21st century, and in particular, Epictetus' version of Stoicism. You have heard already at least two uh, overt attempts to update Stoicism, one by Peter and the other one by Sharon. And, uh, and in fact, there is a lot of updating that was inherent or implied in several of the other, of the other talks that we've heard today. So I'll, I'll just give you uh, my version of it. And, um, and hopefully in the future, we can have all, all of us a discussion about where Stoicism is going to go for the 21st century and uh, beyond. So the first, let me get, get out the, the obvious questions. One, why? Why would anybody want to update uh, stoicism and the second of this question despite the very nice introduction uh, by Don who the hell are you Massimo to update Epictetus well um, there is a couple of I think reasonable answers uh, to that kind of question first of all every philosophy or religion evolves with the times whether they want it or not uh, it, it evolves I define actually a philosophy of life uh, as, a, um, as having three components, uh, broadly speaking. A metaphysics, that's an account of how the world works, hangs together in a sense. An ethics, that's an account of how to live in the world. And a set of practices. And I include that, by that definition, you, inc you can include relig all religions also as philosophies of life. They're just particular cases of philosophies of life, like I grew up uh, Christian Catholic, and you know the the metaphysics includes a creator God who is all, all powerful and all benevolent. A, uh, the ethics includes the Ten Commandments and uh, uh, your you know the, the teachings of Jesus, and then of course the practice includes prayer, reading scripture, going to church, that sort of stuff. The same goes for Stoicism. The same goes for Buddhism. So it goes for everything, and these things evolve. Nobody today is a, is a Christian or Buddhist in the way in which people were Christian or Buddhist two, two millennia ago, two and a half millennia ago. So why not Stoicism? Not only that, but Stoicism actually did evolve through, throughout its five or six centuries of early history from the founding by Zeno of Citium until the, late, the latest great uh, Stoic that we know of, that's Marcus Aurelius, right? Um, it evolved into three different periods, there, which scholars not very imaginatively referred to as early, middle, and late store. But it evolved more importantly because there were discussions. Cleantes disagreed with Zeno. Chrysippus disagreed with Cleantes. There was a guy named Dionysius the Renegade. That tells you right there the nickname that he was in disagreement with some of the major Stoics, and so on and so forth. So this is nothing new. Uh, Stoicism has evolved internally for hundreds of years uh, before it sort of gave way to the rise of Christianity. So what we're doing today is really nothing new in that sense. Moreover, Stoicism also evolved in response to pressures from other schools, right? There were lots of discussions between the Stoics and the Epicureans, the Stoics and the skeptics, and so on and so forth. Like John Sellers, for instance, uh, devotes a really interesting chapter of his art, The Art of Living to the convoluted and interesting and, and ongoing for centuries discussion between the Stoics and the skeptics about epistemology and about the, the nature of knowledge and what that means, what that implies in terms of living the good life. So that's why uh, Stoicism, I think, uh, you know, does need an, an update because it has always been updated. There is no such thing as Stoicism uh, as, a, as a written, something written in stone that has never changed before. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Seneca that kind of inspires the same kind of approach to things. When I not walk in the footsteps of my predecessors, he writes in one of his letters to Lucilius, I will indeed use the ancient road. But if I find another route that is more direct and has fewer ups and downs, I will stake out that one. Those who advance these doctrines before us are not our masters, but our guides. The truth lies open to all. It has not yet been taken over. Much is left also for those yet to come. Right? So that should be the spirit in which we engage these discussions about, about updating stoicism and how, how to go about it and so on. Now, to the second question, well, isn't a little bit pretentious of me in particular to do that sort of stuff? Well, maybe, but I'm in good company. The Enchiridion uh, in specifically has been updated actually a number of times uh, throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It was at least four different versions were produced uh, to train, to help training Christian monks uh, in the 10th century, 11th century, 14th century, 17th century. And we've heard early, early from Sharon LaBelle, who produced her own version 
uh, as recently as 1995. So this is, this is an ongoing continuing process. Stoicism in general has been updated again a number of times. Uh, perhaps the most famous update, updates so far um, have been the, the neo-Stoicism of Justus Lipsius during the Renaissance. Again, I highly recommend an article in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy by John Sellers about neo-Stoicism. And then by Larry Baker, who you've heard of today, uh, been mentioned a couple of times by Peter, uh, who wrote a new Stoicism. Uh, that the title tells you everything, uh, although there is quite a bit there in, in, in that book, and I highly recommend it, uh, although it's not for the faint of heart, because it does require a little bit of background in philosophy to actually get through uh, successfully. This is just to show you uh, what I was doing before COVID. Um, so the, the, the upper picture, the, the, uh, the picture on the top is actually the theater in uh, Hierapolis. It's in Western Turkey. That's where Epictetus was born. It's a wonderful UNESCO heritage site. I highly recommend after the pandemic eventually will subside or you know, be over to go and take a look because it's, it's a spectacular site and you will literally walk on the same streets where Epictetus uh, was uh, you know, growing up as a, as a child. The picture on the bottom, on the other hand, is a panoramic view, which is why that's why it's a little distorted, of the Odeon, the little theater at Nicopolis, that's in northwestern Greece, and that's where Epictetus was sent into exile by the emperor Domitian, and then where, where he restarted his school, which became the most famous and most attracted school of the early second century. Now, just a little reminder of the you know Epictetus 101. Uh, we've heard several times today mentioned the dichotomy of control, so or sometimes as it's referred to, I think better better term is the stoic fork. This is the notion that everything can be divided into two major branches: the things that are up to us, as Epictetus puts puts it, and the things that are not up to us. In the first group, they're only our priorities, our decisions to act or not to act, and our considered judgments. In other words, a small part, as Greg was saying earlier today, of our mental life. Uh, that part that deals with conscious decision making, essentially. Everything else is not up to us. And that includes, of course, health, wealth, career and reputation. And as Chris pointed out uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, in a pandemic, we certainly all discovered that health also is not under our control. Not under our control doesn't mean that we cannot do anything about it. It just means that we can make good decisions about how to take care of our health. That's That belongs to the left side of the of the fork uh, but the outcome is not up to us right um, i can do everything and i do everything that i can in order to stay away from covid but you know i'm a biologist uh, biologist i know that viruses are little creepy little things that can get you no matter what uh, even if you are in fact being very careful so in a sense as, as i said it's uh, on the one hand you have everything that is internal and conscious on the other hand you have everything external which does include your own body the bottom line, according to if one if we follow the the um, uh, the dichotomy control or the, the stoic fork, is that we should essentially internalize our goals. This is this comes through through this quote, and I'm not going to read in full by uh, Cicero in the third book of the the Finibus Bonorum et Malorum, where he basically says, "Look, um, your efforts, your your attempts, your um, your your." Decisions to do things are up to you, but then whatever happens after the outcome is not up to you. You can influence it, obviously, but it's not, you don't control it. The other thing to remember about Epictetus, of course, is his famous three disciplines, desire, assent, and action. Uh, the discipline of desire or desire and aversion essentially teaches us how to reorganize our priorities. It turns out that according to Epictetus and the Stoics, we tend to prioritize the, the wrong things fame, fortune, love, you know, that sort of stuff. Love in the general sense, not, not, in, not necessarily in the sense of serious relationships. I do agree with Sharon before that there, are, there certainly is a, a room for uh, love in Stoicism, but we need to reorganize our priorities. The discipline of action tells us, uh, teaches us how to deal with other people and how to act in life in general, because Stoicism is a practical philosophy. It, it's about how to act in life. And then the discipline of ascent is about improving our judgment. In a sense, the discipline of ascent is the most important one, although the Epictetus tells us it's the most difficult to actually perfect. And it's the most important one because, in fact, if you think about it, uh, reorganizing our priorities, desire, and uh, learning how to 
behave in life uh, action, they're both the result of our ascent, they're both the result of our capacity to, uh, to refine our judgment. Pierre Hadot famously connected these three disciplines to the three classical uh, uh, areas of study in Stoic philosophy, physics, which is about understanding the world. It's what I called earlier metaphysics and natural science, deals with the discipline of desire. Ethics obviously deals with the discipline of action, and logic deals with the discipline of assent, with, with judgment. Very well. So that was the basic uh, summary of Epictetus. Now, what about these attempts that I make in a field uh, guide to the happy life to try to update Epictetus' version of Stoicism and, in, and, and sort of uh, secondarily Stoicism in general to the 21st century? Well, those are seven of the topics that I focus on. Basically, the structure of the book is exactly parallel to the Enchiridion. There are 53 sections, other than a, a small introduction on Stoicism and a small coda, there are 53 sections. Each one of those 53 sections parallels is exactly Epictetus. It is on the same topic, but sometimes my language is simply updated to you know, modern English and, and with modern examples, but it doesn't differ in substance from Epictetus. In about 45, 50% of the times, however, the case is uh, my, it's not just my language, it's also the concepts that are, that are a little bit different, although still informed by and inspired by Epictetus himself. So those are the, the seven topics that I then, uh, at the end of the book, I actually detail where the differences are. There is a table at the end of the book that says, okay, here's the original, here's the different uh, version. So let me go uh, quickly to at least some of these uh, areas in which I think we need to have a discussion. I'm not suggesting that this is gonna be certainly not the last word uh, on, on stoicism, uh, update in stoicism, but, but I think we need to have a discussion. And in fact, we have been having a discussion today and it will continue hopefully after the conference about these seven areas. So let me start with the first one. Externals don't need to be despised. A lot of the language that the ancient Stoics use, particularly Epictetus and Seneca, and in fact, also uh, Marcus Aurelius, they, they encourage to despise externals, right? They use that, that word very, very often, at least in, in, in modern English translations. And sometimes you get, you get this feeling that certainly Epictetus is much more on the sort of close to the cynic end of things. Uh, he really admired the cynics and, and their uh, extreme minimalism and extreme doing away with everything uh, external. But in fact, Stoicism is not cynicism. It's a different thing. Uh, and in fact, virtue cannot be practiced even without externals. Externals are important because though that's exactly how you practice your virtue. Virtue by itself in a vacuum doesn't exist. You cannot be virtuous without actually acting on externals. However, still uh, uh, differently from what Aristotle says, externals do, do remain not necessary. They're only preferred, right? The Stoic life is sufficient. It, uh, for the Stoic, we, we, we live a, worth, a life worth living, even though uh, our external situation might be uh, pretty dire, uh, might be very suboptimal. We are happy, so to speak, um, even on the rack, uh, although we can have a discussion about what that means exactly. So externals are there to be practiced on, to exercise our virtue, but they're not absolutely necessary for a uh, eudaimonic life, uh, contra to Aristotle. Two, no need to cultivate indifference to human, indifference to human loss. Again, this is a matter of, uh, uh, to some extent, language, but also there's something fundamental here. The Stoics believed in a particular version, a particular view of the, of the universe as a living organism endowed with the logos. Um, so with this ability to essentially being rational, right? So everything was rational, happened, everything happened for a reason. It's very clear in some of the Stoic texts or in some of, of uh, Cicero's texts about what the Stoics thought at the, at the time. The modern phrase introduced by Nietzsche, who was not a Stoic, is amor fati, love your fate. Well, you could do that. You could love your fate uh, if you believe in Stoic providence. The Epictetus uh, analogy with the foot that has to step into the mud and he's going to be happy to step into the mud because it, it realizes that it belongs to a body and the body has to get home and that's therefore the only way for the body to do so is for the the, the uh, foot to step into the mud. It's great. That is why Epictetus says that you shouldn't be disturbed if your loved ones die because that's they're doing it that what happens to everybody is for the good of the universe. We are literally fulfilling whatever our role in the in the you know general functioning of the of the cosmos is. Well, 
I don't know about you, but as a modern scientist, I don't believe that the universe is a living organism and that would look us. It, the universe is a set of dynamic processes that are regulated by what we call laws of nature, which are simply uh, empirical generalizations arrived at by modern science. So no, I cannot not be disturbed if my daughter should die, let's say. Um, but I can still endure it. I can still accept it as, as a natural uh, part of what it means to be alive, that you know, we're mortal. So, so something needs to change that uh, there as well. Number three, living according to nature. This is a famous stoic phrase. It means a number of different things. Um, again, however, it certainly in, in ancient stoicism, it meant living according to whatever it is that the logos of the cosmos uh, determines. Well, um, but in terms of modern science, in particular modern evolutionary uh, theory, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I don't think that rationality is a cosmic thing. I, rationality evolved locally, uh, at least on planet Earth, possibly in other places, we don't know, as a result of a series of twists and turns of history. And it might simply not have and never happened. And not, there's nothing inevitable or cosmic about it, which means that uh, to follow uh, my friend uh, Larry Baker, to live according to universal nature these days just means follow the facts. In particular, accept the facts of science. Somebody asked earlier in the in the chat, you know, should a modern stoic, uh, you know, put on a mask during a pandemic? Yes, because that is following the facts of science, the best that we understand. If the, those that understanding changes, then we change our behavior accordingly. Number four, questionable science or metaphysics. Of course, the Stoics lived between 23 centuries and 18 centuries ago. You know, science was really very much at the beginning. Metaphysics also arguably was very much at the beginning. And uh, so we know better today. There are a number of things that we know better. For instance, the ancient Stoics believed in divination. And you do find that in, in a reference to divination in Epictetus, um, which for them was a logical corollary of the notion that the universe is governed by a, a universal web of cause and effect. Now, we retain that notion, that other notion, that is how modern science works, but we don't believe in divination, so we don't do divination. Uh, we also don't believe in a number of other things. For instance, the Stoics believe that the hegemonicon, the ruling faculty that Marcos Aurelius often talked about, talks about, uh, it was located in the heart. Well, they were wrong. If it's located anywhere, it's in the parietal lobes of the human brain. God or atoms. Um, there's a surprising, num surprising attempt, number of attempts by modern Stoics and by uh, people that refer to themselves as traditional Stoics to revive the concept of, of a universe God and, uh, and to argue that uh, modern science is actually compatible with it. I have written a couple of very detailed articles about this and why I disagree with that notion. But if you go to the ancient sources themselves, it's clear why they believe so. And they were not crazy. This, this was a very reasonable belief at the time. If you look, for instance, uh, in, uh, to Cicero's um, On the Nature of the Gods, the second book of that, of that um, uh, the second chapter, I guess we would call it, but they call it a second book of that, is devoted to the Stoic understanding of uh, the structure of the cosmos. And you can see very clearly that the Stoics, the ancient Stoics, advance a number of arguments in favor of their view of the universe as a living organism. But the major one, the big one that comes up, uh, up repeatedly, it's made by Cleanthus and Chrysippus among the early Stoics. It's made explicitly in the discourses by Epictetus among the late Stoics is essentially what we today call an argument from design. Right? Epictetus uses these analogies, says the universe it looks to me like a, um, a sword that fits a scabbard, right? So it's, it's designed, it's, there's an intelligence behind it. Well, move forward to the, to the 19th century and uh, to the 18th, 19th century, we got David Hume, uh, Scottish philosopher of the enlightenment and Charles Darwin. I believe that um, it's reasonable to argue that those two basically dealt a fatal blow to the argument from design. Today, while it was very perfectly reasonable for Epictetus to think so or for Chrysippus, Today, uh, the, the design argument doesn't stand a chance against modern philosophy and modern science. But then again, Marcus Aurelius himself realized that this is possibly not much consequence. There are several places in the meditations where he begins a, uh, a thought by saying something along the lines of, well, there's either God or atoms. He's referring there, of course, to the Stoic view on the one hand and to the uh, Epicurean view on the other hand. He was not agnostic about it. 
he was clearly on the stoic side but the very fact that at least six or seven times in the meditations he brings this up and every time he concludes well even if the epicureans are right even if it is all atoms bumping into the void uh what it, what does that change for me i still have to do the job of a human being i still have to get up in the morning and be the best human being that i can be helpful to my fellow human beings and so on and so forth so i think that we can do away with that picture just like uh, marcus Aurelius showed us and without suffering too much of a consequence in terms of uh, of update to to modern um, to modern philosophy and modern ethics now, let me, let me say, however, that it is true that the Stoics did connect very clearly the metaphysics, the, the ethics, and, and, and the logic. And they thought that, you know, you, knew, you do need an understanding, a good understanding of how the world works and a good amount of reasoning, you know, sound reasoning in order to live a good, uh, a good life, the ethical life. But what I'm suggesting here, and this has been suggested before, by others is that those connections are not rigid it's not that if you take away one bit of stoic metaphysics all of a sudden the entire thing collapses it's a web of logical interconnections so you can cut one thread and re re uh, assess the rest of the web and so that this, the entire system remains coherent at least that's my uh, my way of looking at it number six Local customs are neither universal nor immutable. You know, the Stoics were, again, people of their time, as Sharon pointed out. Uh, there are some bits and pieces in, uh, in Seneca and Epictetus that are positively cringeworthy, right? Even though, for instance, uh, Seneca explicitly says that women have the same, in, 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 the, in his letter to Marcia, he says women have the same mental ability as men, so they should study philosophy and practice virtue. Great. But then you read the letters and he keeps telling to Lucilius, you know, don't be womanly about these things. It's like, ah. Uh. But he was a man of his time. He was, you know, you know, he lived, lived 2,000 years ago. What do you expect? Um, we should be charitable toward those that preceded us and take the best of what they did and, you know, charitably understand and put into place uh, the parts that don't actually work and, and, and do away with them. So, so that's, that's about uh, women, the, the status of women in particular, but also, of course, all sorts of social customs. For instance, for the ancient Roman Stoics, sex was only for procreation and only within marriage. Even though Epictetus does say, don't criticize other people if they do otherwise, but he says that's what we should do. Musonius Rufus, Epictetus' teacher, also says something like that. Well, you know, we don't believe that, that sort of stuff anymore. So we can retain the basic concept, the basic ideas, for instance, never use somebody else as a means to an end, as Kant would put it. Don't, don't use other people for your own pleasure. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you should be uh, following the morals, the specific morals of ancient Roman times. There are, in fact, a number of, of modern authors. Uh, here I'm, I'm mentioning two, Scott Eichen and Emily McGill, Rutherford, who are, have been exploring uh, new Stoic thinking, and for instance, as it relates to uh, feminism and, and uh, associated issues. And here, I mean, by feminism, I mean simply the basic notion that women are just as human beings as men, and therefore they are entitled to the same sort of privileges, duties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, the last one is number seven, justice at a societal level. This is a similar kind of uh, uh, issue. So the ancient Stoics, for instance, said uh, things about, uh, against slavery. They said that slavery is evil. That's in uh, one of the fragments that we have from uh, uh, Zeno, the founder of Stoicism. They also fought against uh, tyranny, uh, the famous Stoic opposition. They were cosmopolitan. So there were a lot of things in ancient Stoicism that were way ahead of their own time. Even so, uh, the times have changed quite dramatically, and we can now rearticulate uh, some of those notions in a broader perspective. For instance, why be cosmopolitan uh, in the sense of only caring about humanity at large? We should be caring about every sentient uh, living organism, and the reason for that is the one that uh, utilitarian philosopher Jer Jeremy Bentham uh, put forth. He said famously that the right question as far as animals, uh, animals are, is concerned is not whether they can think, uh, but it's where they, they, they can suffer. And if they suffer, then we have an ethical duty to reduce or eliminate such suffering. Uh, modern authors, including Larry Baker, Chris Gale, who you just heard, uh, Gabriele Galluzzo, Kai Whiting, all of these people have actually been working on this already. So again, this is actually an effort that is, that is brought forth by a number of people to uh, expand 
uh, Stoicism to modern times from an ethical perspective. Again, while retaining, however, the basic ideas, while retaining the spirit of ancient Stoicism. So Stoicism, as I said, has always been and will presumably continue to be a living, evolving, ethical and practical uh, philosophy of life. And plenty of people have contributed to uh, changing and updating it and, and, and bringing it forth over the literally the millennia. And you can see a selection of those people, several of whom have been speakers uh, today at today's conference uh, in, this, in this slide. So that's what I had to say. That's the book, A Field Guide to a Happy Life, 53 uh, Brief Lessons for Living. And I hope you'll check it out uh, because we need this conversation. We need to have, and of course, the conversation doesn't mean agreement, it doesn't mean consensus. It just means that we're gonna have a conversation. And in order to have a conversation, we need to put this stuff out there. I did, Sharon did, uh, Peter did, Larry Baker did. Uh, and many other. Chris is doing it now, um, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to be a part of this conference.